Someone's going to have to clean that up. Okay. Let's talk about Taken on a Train, a.k.a. The Commuter. So, this is going to be not as not as organized as the ones that I have in my notebook. Because I have it on Keep, which I have on my phone, but I learned from looking at the footage for last time that showing my phone screen to the camera while the screen is actually on, the screen, if I could remember to display examples properly, the screen is horribly overexposed, usually, so that's not a good visual. That doesn't go hand in hand with how well the rest of the video is shot at all. Anyways, let's get into it. Oh, most of this, speaking of visuals, is going to be based on the visuals, because that's the biggest thing that I liked about the commuter. Um, so we'll start with the very beginning of the movie. We have a very cool intro montage that's like a bunch of Liam Neeson's days intercut between each other. And it's not necessarily in any kind of sequence, it's kind of jumping around to all points of the year to sort of give you the idea that this is a guy who's got his routine set in stone. He does everything you're going to see throughout the movie all the time. That's why he gets picked for this task, as well as being an ex-cop. Um, like, all of his days just kind of bleed together. Um, yes, there are some ups and downs given to you via, there's a clip of him fighting with his wife, but there's also clips of him either getting along with or not necessarily wanting to read the books that his son keeps throwing on him. Really cool intro montage, and it's shot in a way that I really like. The whole movie is shot in a way that I really like. Sort of like this, but even tighter on the characters' faces that I'm not willing to go into. Um, especially since I don't have as interesting a face as Liam Neeson, but I will demonstrate what I mean, if it'll focus. Yeah, that's that's good enough. Um, it gets even... It gets even tighter than that, really. It's just bokeh everywhere, and they use much, much faster lenses than this one to do it like you can still almost make out what this is Maryland moonshine that bottle didn't last very long um, but there's um, there's a lot of visual shit that I like about this movie I also have my lights set to blue and orange uh, contrast because of this movie gotta match the aesthetics man um, next thing visually that I liked um, actually, we'll come back to this one. I have a checklist here. We'll come back to that, because this is... That, that is the point that I'll get to, that this movie crosses into... I believe the proper term is schlock territory. So, plot-wise, the whole thing feels really like the movie Eagle Eye, or like Portal, which is what Eagle Eye felt like, um, in that... Anything that Liam Neeson does, he's obviously being watched, and he can be contacted at any point through his or the surrounding people's phones. Um, whoever is in charge just knows everybody's everything, but just doesn't know the information about the one person they need to know it. And you would think maybe they could use process of elimination, but... Nope, can't do that. Um... Not a ridiculous amount of noticeable cuts during action. There are a few fights with, like, CQC, and at least as far as I noticed, there's nothing as ridiculous as Brian Mills jumps a fence from Taken 3. If you don't know what I mean by that, there's a bit in Taken 3, which I didn't see, but there's a bit in there where there's, like, 13-plus cuts in a 9-second sequence of um, Liam Neeson jumping a fence. Nothing nearly on that level. There might be a few cuts, but a lot of them are well enough hidden that it kind of looks like one take when they need it to look like one take. 
and going back to the intro sequence, there is a long, not tracking shot, but there's just a long, wide shot of Liam Neeson walking through the frame. And as he's walking, his out his outfit changes, the crowd changes or completely disappears, and it's just reinforcing that every day bleeds together routine type of thing. Um, already covered, it's very pretty and lots of bokeh. There is... Um, okay, I'll get to that when I get to the other thing. Um, I already mentioned the close-ups are just... Just a little too close for me. Probably a lot too close for some people. You get the sense of attack of the 50-foot Liam Neeson a lot of the time. Um, Plot-wise, it's a mystery. And it's a mystery on a train. So it's actually a better train mystery for me than Murder on the Orient Express was. Because this one was fair in the sense that you are given all the clues... And there is actually one person to figure out who it is. And you're given what you need. I didn't figure it out. Unlike Murder on the Ori Orient Express where I did figure it out. But that's only because every answer was correct. This was... I wasn't paying close enough attention to one little detail. And therefore I had no idea who it might have been. I had completely forgotten that this person existed, actually. Uh, do, 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 let's see. Okay, so back to the visual thing that I wanted to get to, which is where it crosses into complete schlock. Um, so we get through the intro, and we get through the uh, introducing the conflict, which is... Do this one thing for me, and there will be $100,000 in cash in it for you on the other side. He takes the twenty-five grand out of the um, out of the bathroom. He goes to find out something or other. And then at the next station, he's handed an envelope. And in the envelope has his wife's wedding ring. And I called it in my head before the next shot. He looks at the rings. And actually, let me, let me... Okay. So he looks at the rings. And then he, like... In the next shot, he like, looks up. And he's looking at the camera. And then you get the dolly zoom. And if you don't know what a dolly zoom is... I'll either put in the Jaws one, or I'll shoot my own... More than likely, I'll put in the Jaws one, but it's it's the opposite version of a dolly zoom than the Jaws one, where the camera moves back and the lens zooms in. Focus. Focus. Okay. The lens zooms in and, like, the background compresses and, like, gets flatter. The whole image gets flatter. Um, so I was like... Do a dolly zoom, and then they did a dolly zoom, and I was like, oh my god, yes. So, at that point in the movie, I was just smiling my face off, and it didn't go away for the remainder of the movie, because that was so stupid. And then there was actually another, not camera move, but, like, technique that was used a little bit before that in the movie, where he's in his office getting fired because they gotta hammer home how desperately he needs this $100,000. He's in his office getting fired, and I cannot demonstrate this one with the lens that I'm using, but um, what they do is they nail the focus on his eyes, and then they crank open the aperture, like, from everything's in focus, to almost nothing is in focus other than his face. And you, like, see the bokeh balls get bigger in the background, and it's insane to me because the uh, the exposure of the image doesn't change at all. And it just blew my mind. I'm like, I can sort of wrap my head around how they did that because I know that variable ND filters exist, 
Um, In-camera variable ND filters exist. But, like, opening an aperture... You have to nail the focus with the aperture all the way open. You have to nail the exposure all the way through the aperture range, which just sounds like demon magic to me. Like, I, I think it has to be... I feel like it would be easier to do it as a post effect, even though like one of the ways that you probably could do it is to just change the shutter speed, like put the camera in aperture priority mode, and then just let it change the shutter speed throughout the shot, because it doesn't, there's not enough movement by Liam Neeson in the scene, like he's completely static. There's not enough movement for you to notice that the shutter angle changed. Like, if I was to do this through the whole thing, and then I was to change my aperture and let the shutter speed change, you would notice my hand getting choppier and choppier. Um, ha, choppier. Um, you would notice more and more stutter on the movement of my hand if the uh, shutter speed was changing. Now, if I was to dynamically adjust a dynamic, um, not polarizer, what the fuck, ND filter. If I was to adjust an ND filter while opening the aperture in such a way that they just match each other, then I guess you could just, yeah, you could do that, but it's, I don't know, it's crazy to me. Like, dolly zooms are insane as well. I don't understand how that works. Like, I understand how it works, and because I understand how it works, I don't fucking get it. How how do you do that? Um, and this is another thing now that I've learned is possible, maybe, probably was a post effect, but it still absolutely blew my mind when they did it. I thought it was awesome. And, like... It was visual storytelling. Everything's in focus, and then he gets fired. The sound kind of drops out, and the room goes out of focus. So you're like, yeah, what the hell does any of this other shit matter? All that matters is Liam Neeson's thoughts right now. We don't even hear those. We just know that he just completely threw everything but himself out the window because none of that shit mattered in the scene for the remainder of it. So back to pass the point of the silly dolly zoom we have well my note just says big stupid banana grin during the climax thanks day nine for the phrase banana grin uh <laughs> the climax has things such as the train derails and actually before the train derails liam neeson and the conductor of the train are like we need to try and decouple our back car from the rest of the train. And early in the movie, the conductor had said, between the train and the people, or if the train doesn't kill me, the people will. And then it comes back to them going to do this. They decouple the car, and then there's still a chain, because I guess the people who put this scenario in place thought of everything. Uh... <laughs> There's a chain on the car that's holding it together. And Liam Neeson jumps over, and it's really silly. And then the conductor goes to get an axe, and he jumps over, and he goes, Between the train and the people, I knew it would be the train. <laughs> and then he breaks the chain. Uh, and then, like, they wind up getting saved. Um, the conductor dies because the train derails and it throws him off the train, whatever. Uh, so then you have what is deemed a hostage situation by the cops. Liam Neeson has everybody put newspaper up on the windows, and then <laughs> one of the cops comes in who has something else to do with this situation, and it gets really intense as to, who's Prin? Guns start getting waved around in people's faces, and... The real Prin speaks up. She, she, uh, she's been established at this point. The real Prin speaks up, but then someone else goes, No, I'm Prin. I'm Prin. And I was waiting for someone to just say, I'm Spartacus. 
They, they do that shit. Uh, while the train was derailing, there was some multi-track drifting going on. Which I was just like, deja vu! In my head. Uh, then, after all is said and done, Liam Neeson gets back on the force as a cop. Because he needed the money, and the chief was like, We miss guys like you on the force. You should get your job back, or whatever. It's like implied that he's going to be a cop again, and you expect the credits to roll before he gets his job back. But it doesn't. It just cuts to Liam back on the train, back to some routine, because it doesn't make sense at this point why he'd be riding the train. Even as a cop, there's no reason for him to be riding a train. What the fuck is he doing as part of his daily routine? And the lady from the trailer who set this whole scenario up is riding the train. For what reason, I don't know, because she was just there to facilitate this whole scenario with Liam Neeson. So, her plan failed. And she just chose to go back to the scene of the crime and hang out? Because there's no way this lady works an office job. She's working for someone very, very, very powerful. And I can't imagine that said powerful people just want to play these games with random people all the time. So she's just there for Liam Neeson to notice her and flash his badge like, You're under arrest! And then the credits roll and it's just... Uh, I laughed so hard at so many parts of this movie. It was so funny. Probably ruined it, but go see The Commuter. See you all next one.